What's up, mortals, and welcome to part two of the history of the greatest ghost story ever told. So when we last left off, Ghostbusters 2 had just premiered in the summer of 1989, and once the real Ghostbusters cartoon ran its course and ended in the fall of 91, hysteria for the franchise died down a bit for a while, and not much was done with it other than a real Ghostbusters Game Boy game that came out in 93, but only featured Vankman as a playable character, and was basically just a version of the Crazy Castle franchise that featured licensed characters like Garfield, Mickey Mouse, Bugs Bunny, and Woody Woodpecker. A few years later, however, another animated series called Extreme Ghostbusters would premiere in the fall of 97. This series was a spin-off of the real Ghostbusters, taking place years later, and in this version, an older Egon, now a professor, would guide a group of young students who served as the Ghostbusters of a new generation. Janine would also be featured in this version, and Egon would again be voiced by Maurice LaMarche. Ray, Winston, and Venkman would also return for a two-part episode with the original real Ghostbusters voice actors, and Slimer would be a permanent character voiced by Billy West, best known for his work as the voice of Ren and Stimpy, Fry from Futurama, and the Red M&M. The show only lasted for 40 episodes, but introduced many new youngsters to the franchise. It was available on Hulu for a few years until March of 2021, and some episodes have since been posted to the official Ghostbusters YouTube channel. Over the years, other games were developed and many discussions were had by writers, producers, and the cast for developing a third feature film. Dan Aykroyd continued to work on scripts, none of which were said to have been closely related to the original, but rather more closely to the plan he originally had, with the Ghostbusters traveling to other dimensions. Some ideas that had been passed around since the mid-90s include names being considered for the project like Chris Rock, Chris Farley, and Ben Stiller. Ultimately, Bill Murray passed on every script sent his way, saying nothing seemed well executed or worth his time. Because of this, some ideas were thought up that didn't include the Venkman character at all, just Ray and Egon moving forward to mentor a new team without him, similar to the plot of the Extreme Ghostbusters animated series. Other scripts include versions of the film where Venkman dies in the beginning and becomes a ghost himself, to prevent Murray from needing to play a major role, but he still passed. Rumors also swirled that Jonah Hill and Emma Stone were in discussion to take part in different projects, as well as Charlie Day or Jesse Eisenberg to play Venkman's son. Some writers had the idea of baby Oscar growing up to become a Ghostbuster. This in my opinion seems like it has potential. Like I mentioned in our last video, I always like it when they use the same characters in sequels, even if Oscar was just a baby in the last film. By including him in the next version, it would make a reason to bring back Sigourney Weaver, although it could end up being like the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, and we all know how that turned out. While talks continued over the years, an awesome game was created that sort of served as a third sequel and featured many of the ideas Aykroyd had planned for the potential third film. It was simply called Ghostbusters The Video Game and featured all four voices of all the original crew, as well as Annie Potts and other actors from the films. It also had the original music and many themes from the two movies. The game was created and released for Nintendo, Xbox, PlayStation, and PC in 2009, and has since been remastered and re-released for the newest consoles from those companies. The gameplay essentially plays out like a movie, with the player being an additional rookie character joining the original four Ghostbusters, and the collaboration on the project got Murray interested in the idea of reuniting for another film finally, with Ivan Reitman in mind again to direct. However, after Harold Ramis' passing in 2014, Reitman backed out, not wanting to be involved without all four original team members. Since a proper sequel would now be impossible, it was decided that they should just do a reboot instead, and in the same year of Harold Ramis' death, news hit the public that Paul Feig had been selected as the director of the new Ghostbusters reboot, which would feature an all-female cast. Feig being a fairly accomplished director and producer, having created the 90s team dramedy Freaks and Geeks, and also having done work on popular shows like The Office, Arrested Development, and Mad Men, had producers feeling confident he could take on the task. 
I personally know him best, however, for his acting role as the camp counselor in the 1995 Disney film Heavyweights. He also directed the hit 2011 film Bridesmaids, which consisted of a female-led cast, and was produced by Judd Apatow, being his most successful project to date. This is most likely why Feig felt he could recapture that magic and apply it to the Ghostbusters franchise. What could go wrong? Two cast members from Bridesmaids, Kristen Wiig and Melissa McCarthy, would star as two of the new Ghostbusters, and the other roles would be played by Kate McKinnon and Leslie Jones of Saturday Night Live fame. Kristen Wiig also being a former SNL cast member like Dan Aykroyd and Bill Murray before her. Chris Hemsworth was brought on to play the supporting male version of the Janine character in this movie, only instead of being a witty, helpful, appreciated addition to the team, the character was portrayed as the typical incompetent dumb white male, unable to measure up to the genius of his strong, capable, intelligent, stunning, brave female employers. In this version of the story, two physicists, Abby Yates and Aaron Gilbert, played by McCarthy and Wig, are reunited when Gilbert realizes Yates has re-released Ghosts from Our Past, a book co-authored by the two detailing their investigations of the paranormal, prior to Gilbert giving up on the research and the relationship. Once Aaron visits Abby to discuss the re-release of the book, she meets Jillian Holtzman, Abby's new research partner, played by Kate McKinnon. And while joining them in a visit to a haunted mansion, they come across a ghost that excites them all and leads them to starting the Ghostbusters business. They can't afford a cool firehouse to run the business from like the original movies, so they instead move into an apartment above a restaurant before hiring Kevin, a handsome but completely moronic hunk to be their assistant. Soon after, they meet Patty Tolan, a subway worker who encounters a ghost while on the job, played by Leslie Jones, and they hire her as the fourth buster. In this film, the ghosts are generated from a portal to another dimension created by Rowan North, a madman on a power trip who's obsessed with the paranormal and has a plan to terrorize the city with an army of supernatural beings, even becoming a ghost himself. Once he does, he possesses Kevin, using his body to release the ghosts from the portal, before transforming into a giant CGI version of the original Ghostbusters logo and attempting to destroy the city. But before he can, he's stopped by the Ghostbusters, who send him and all the other ghosts back through the portal and close it, saving the day. This movie was not well received. Many Ghostbusters fans had negative opinions about the project prior to the movie's release, in anticipation for what they viewed as an abomination of their beloved franchise. And unfortunately, they knew exactly what they'd be getting. Once the movie was released, opinions didn't really change. Most people felt the same way about this film that they do about most reboots in the 21st century. They wished the producers had just left it alone. The opinions of critics, however, had a much different vibe. The only problem is, everything in the 21st century is so political that you can no longer count on the reviews of critics to determine if a movie is watchable, let alone good. Although you could argue that the critics of the 20th century really couldn't be trusted either. Back then, they seemed to pan anything that wasn't some kind of Oscar-worthy masterpiece, especially in the comedy genre. If they hated it, there's a good chance you'd love it. Whereas now, critics' opinions are the exact opposite. If they love it, you better believe you're going to hate it. And that couldn't be more true than when it comes to Ghostbusters 2016. Most critics had positive opinions, but it seemed like they were more focused on propping up a group of women playing roles that were originally created for men, rather than focusing solely on what's important here, which in my opinion is the same thing I already mentioned in the last video regarding Ghostbusters 2. Is the story good? Were the special effects good? Was it well executed? And is it funny? Unfortunately, this film fails on all fronts, but the critics just seem to want to prove that Ghostbusters don't need no man, and that the fans were wrong to assume the movie would be bad for featuring women. This is pretty obvious when review after review essentially says the same thing along the lines of the following. Anne Horniday of the Washington Post says, Sunny, slimy, and profoundly silly. The new lady-centric reboot of Ghostbusters immediately silences the backlash and bluster that's preceded it, never deigning to take the skeptical and just plain sexist bait that's been thrown its way since the project was first announced. Amy Nicholson of MTV News says, The big CG sequences are less captivating than simply watching the four ladies kick it with a pizza. 
Wig and McCarthy nestle into their comfortable roles as the soft-spoken Pris and the bustling Madwoman, leaving room for Jones to barge in with her big punchlines. But keep your eyes on the background, because that's where Jones's Saturday Night Live co-star Kate McKinnon lurks, quietly transforming herself into a movie star. Punchlines are the least of what's big about Leslie Jones, but she got the CGI part right. Steve Parsall of the Tampa Bay Times says, Ghostbusters is back. It's not bad. Get used to it. Relax, trolls. Your precious Ghostbusters are in good hands. Not great mitts like Bill Murray, but good enough to silence the online rabble, a backwards sexist bunch. We should now hold the truth as self-evident that all Ghostbusters are created equal, even women, especially those as comically gifted as those in Paul Feig's reboot. If Ghostbusters now becomes the franchise that the original couldn't establish, then thank those women. Plus Chris Hemsworth, a token male in a blockbuster for a change. What is this guy talking about? A multi-film, multi-series, multi-billion dollar franchise. Yeah, the original creators didn't establish anything. We need Melissa McCarthy and Leslie Jones to do that. Rene Rodriguez of the Miami Herald says, This movie will disappoint basement dwellers who worried a female-centric Ghostbusters would somehow ruin their childhoods, because it isn't bad enough to hate. But the film is an even bigger letdown for fans of Melissa McCarthy, Kristen Wiig, Leslie Jones, and Kate McKinnon, who are forced to play most of the material straight, with no room for comedic improvisation. Oh, so it wasn't their fault they weren't funny, they just had no room to be funny. Apparently, Rene Rodriguez isn't aware that they were given room to improvise. They just didn't utilize the space. The air went out of the room a little bit when Chris Hemsworth walks onto your set. I mean, well, the first scene we were doing with him was his interview scene with the ladies, and suddenly he just started improvising jokes, and the ladies looked at me like, did you write that for him? I was like, I, he's, he's off book, he's going for it. Maybe she hasn't seen the original, but a majority of those films was also played straight. Hey, where these stairs go? Most of the comedy came from subtle witty lines and dry humor. They go up. But at least some critics were honest about this film. David Rooney of The Hollywood Reporter says, It's all busyness, noise and chaos, with zero thrills and very little sustainable comic buoyancy. Richard Roper of the Chicago Sun-Times says, Ghostbusters is a horror film from start to finish. That's not me saying it's legitimately scary, more like I was horrified by what was transpiring on screen. Roper, who was Siskel of Siskel and Ebert's replacement when he passed, is one of the few critics who actually holds on to the 20th century critical sensibilities, so it's no surprise that he felt exactly how you'd assume Siskel and Ebert would have felt if they were around to critique this movie. It did earn $230 million, but with a budget of nearly $150 million, it's considered to be a bomb, as it lost around $70 million for the studio. It was the biggest opening weekend box office for Feig's career, as it was for McCarthy's. However, the studio has said that they would need to have earned $300 million just to break even, I suppose to recoup marketing costs. Having come up way short of that, they decided this direction with the Ghostbusters franchise was not one they'd be willing to continue to take. According to Aykroyd, Paul Feig was to blame for the monetary loss, as he wasn't willing to include any of Aykroyd's suggested scenes until after screen tests, which proved reshoots were necessary, adding a hearty sum to the final cost of the film. He's quoted as saying, Paul Feig made a good movie and had a superb cast and plenty of money to do it. We just wish he had been more inclusive to the original creators. It cost everyone, as it's likely Kristen, Leslie, Melissa, and Kate will never reprise their roles as the Ghostbusters, which is sad. Yeah, sad for them, maybe. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I actually think that some of what he said is true. I'm a fan of some of McCarthy and Wig's work, as well as some of McKinnon's on SNL. These are talented people. I'm also a fan of many of the projects Feig has been involved with in the past, like Freaks and Geeks and the other comedies I mentioned. But as far as my opinion of the Ghostbusters 2016 movie, as I said in the last video, I've been a huge fan of the franchise for as long as I can remember. And when I first heard about the plan for this film, I wasn't that excited for it. Not because of the female cast, but simply because most of the sequels or reboots of franchises I loved from my childhood fail to capture the magic of the original, regardless of genre, but especially with comedy. They failed with Willy Wonka, they failed with The Wizard of Oz, Jurassic Park, Coming to America, and they definitely failed with Dumb and Dumber, twice. 
so I didn't assume this would be any different, and I was right not to. After seeing it twice, I solidly felt the story wasn't funny, exciting, or memorable. In fact, I fell asleep while watching it the first time out of boredom. I legitimately only laughed once, and that laugh came from Chris Hemsworth's character when he attempted to design a logo for the ladies. Yes, I am a ghost child and ridiculous things like boob jokes make me laugh. Similar to my favorite joke from the original. This man has no dick. There's no Rick Moranis I didn't know you had your license moments in this movie, so it didn't really excite me. And aside from the lack of laughs, similar to the opinions of some of the critics I mentioned, the CGI just looked so fake and cartoonish, with everything in the movie glowing constantly. It looked so fake it was hard to get sucked into the story. The effects legitimately looked worse than the ones from the original movies which were more realistic despite using primitive technology that was obsolete decades ago. And the ghosts in the original had a glow to them but it was subtle and didn't look like the entire movie was filmed at some kind of haunted rave. As far as the performances, they weren't terrible, but it's hard to replace someone like Bill Murray or Rick Moranis, because there's just a quality about them that contributes something to the franchise you can't really replicate. Even if the new film had been done with another male cast, I think regardless of the gender of the lead characters, the problems with the Ghostbusters reboot that makes it unwatchable would have existed anyway. Now I give them credit for giving roles to all the original actors who did cameos in the film, with the exception of Rick Moranis, but their cameos just weren't satisfying. They played completely different characters and the movie wouldn't have been any worse without them in it. I'll also give them credit for incorporating Stay Puft and Slimer in their own way as well, which is cool for the fans, but again, the CGI with those characters was just so cartoonish that it wasn't really exciting to see them. And they also tried to recreate the Stay Puft scene from the first film with a giant CGI version of the Ghostbusters logo, which again was supposed to be a nostalgic treat, but it just fell flat and didn't create the emotional reaction I think they probably were going for. One last criticism I have of this film is the way they were just blowing up ghosts and destroying them rather than really capturing them like in the original movies. I get that they wanted to have that girl power action scene, but it just seemed a bit off brand. Also, the entire movie in general was a bit off brand. However, one aspect of the final battle scene that was cool was during that Kate McKinnon action sequence when they had that epic version of the original theme playing. It sounded amazing, and the cinematography during that sequence combined with the song was pretty cool even if it wasn't exactly true to the original film. They also did multiple other remakes of the original song for the movie, some staying true to the Ray Parker Jr. version, with others being slightly different takes on the theme. None were chart toppers like songs from Ghostbusters 1 and 2, but the Walk the Moon version of the Ghostbusters theme is a great fresh sounding copy of the original, keeping those 80s vibes with amazing synths but harder hitting drums and a slightly funkier rhythm, and great vocals. The soundtrack has other great tunes as well, featuring a star-studded list of artists like Mark Ronson, Ellie King, Zayn Malik, g Easy, and Fall Out Boy. And to my surprise, they had a really dope funky track with a sick grimy bass line called Girls Talk Boys from that band 5 Seconds of Summer. I always thought these dudes were like a One Direction knockoff or something, but this track's dope, and in my opinion, is on par with some of the best songs to have come out in the last decade from artists like Tame Impala, The Killers, and Cage the Elephant. By the end of this movie, you could tell that it was supposed to be sort of an origin story setting up for a sequel that would follow more of a similar storyline to the originals because they end up getting the finances to rent the firehouse at the end and continue the business. And in a post credit scene, they make a reference to Zool, but because the film was so poorly executed, and therefore hated by fans, as well as a financial bomb, I highly doubt that's going to happen like Aykroyd himself said. In 2019, word went public that another attempt to bring back the Ghostbusters would be made, this time in the form of a third sequel, rather than a reboot or a sequel to the reboot. In order to keep the vibe of this film in line with the originals, Ivan Reitman's son, Jason, was chosen to co-write the script with Gil Kennan, as well as direct, with Ivan signing on as a producer. Upon making this announcement, Jason also stated this movie would be a continuation of the original Ghostbusters story, ignoring the 2016 version. 
However, this was not meant to be a knock at the film or anyone involved with it. He simply wanted to create something that was more part of the original story, a film that he hoped would leave Ghostbuster fans feeling satisfied. He said some aspects of this film were inspired by the work of Paul Feig in the 2016 version of the story, again casting females in lead roles, as well as two males. Dan Aykroyd loved the script and the concept Jason came up with for the new movie as it would tie together all three films, minus the 2016 reboot, creating a sufficient next generation of Ghostbusters with a proper passing of the torch, so to speak. Even Bill Murray loved it and finally agreed to reprise his role as Peter Venkman, as did Aykroyd and Hudson. Harold Ramis' daughter also approved and gave her blessing after reading it, feeling it had the potential to capture the spirit of the first two films. For the main lead character of the movie, Phoebe Spangler, a young actress named McKenna Grace was chosen. Finn Wolford, best known for his work in the It movies and Stranger Things, would play her brother, another buster. Unknown actress and actress Celeste O'Connor and Logan Kim would play the love interest and friends of the two who joined them to complete the new squad of teen Ghostbusters. For this film, Reitman and the production team made a strong effort to analyze and recreate the look and style of creatures from the originals, something that seemed not to have been done in the 2016 version. They also used the animated Real Ghostbusters series as inspiration for one of the ghosts. In order to bring back Egon in this movie, as well as to honor the late Harold Ramis, he would return as a ghost similar to the idea they once had for the Vankman character. They used digital makeup to create the spirit of Egon with Ivan Reitman standing in at times to play him. According to Jason, emotions were running high on the set. With him claiming that he wanted to replicate a recipe and taste something he used to have as a child while on the original set with his father directing. Truly some magic was felt during the creation of this movie, and the audience would soon feel it too. In 2019, principal photography began in Alberta, Canada and lasted until October. The score for this film would also closely resemble that of the originals, using the original composer, Elmer Bernstein's son Peter, as a consultant, as well as incorporating some classic country and soul tunes to set a slightly different mood in this movie than the other two, as this one would take place in a more rural setting. Ghostbusters Afterlife was supposed to be released in July of 2020, but unfortunately, due to the global pandemic, they were forced to push back the date multiple times until finally deciding on a premiere date of November 19th, 2021. Ghostbusters Afterlife takes place in the small town of Somerville, Oklahoma where Egon has spent the last years of his life on a farm, analyzing the paranormal activities stemming from a local haunted coal mine. After suffering from a fatal heart attack caused by an aggressive poltergeist, his daughter moves to the town to inherit the farmhouse with her teenage son and daughter, Trevor and Phoebe. Not long into their stay, Phoebe realizes the house is haunted, which leads her to discovering her dead grandfather Egon's old Ghostbuster equipment, specifically a ghost trap. After taking the trap to school to show her new best friend podcast, her teacher Gary sees what she has and explains the history of the Ghostbusters and their work in Manhattan during the events of the previous movies. They then try to open the trap, releasing a creature that immediately returns to the haunted coal mine. Soon after, Phoebe realizes the ghost haunting their house is that of her grandfather, who guides her to finding the rest of the original Ghostbuster equipment, which her and podcast attempt to practice using. They then come across another ghost on the farm, this time a dangerous one, and with the help of her brother Trevor, they start up the old Ecto-1 which is hidden away in a barn on the property and chase the ghost through the town, attempting to zap and trap it. After getting pulled over and put in jail for driving without a license, Phoebe uses her one phone call to dial the original Ghostbuster phone number she saw in an online video, and to her surprise, the number is still active, with Ray Stantz picking up the phone. He then explains the events that took place since the time of the previous films, which led Egon to move from Manhattan to Oklahoma. After being released from the jail, Phoebe podcasts Trevor and his new crush Lucky, a co-worker he met at the local diner where he works, travel down into the mine to figure out what exactly is going on down there only to discover a system of automatic proton guns Egon created to prevent Gozer from escaping from a temple deep within the mine. 
She manages to escape anyway, but luckily, the original Ghostbusters arrive just in time to join the teens and Ghost of Egon in a battle against Gozer to once again save the day. Reviews for this movie were sort of a mixed bag, with the majority of fans feeling that Jason had effectively accomplished his goal of offering the audience a proper continuation of the original, keeping a similar tone while allowing the franchise to move forward in a new direction. Others, as well as critics, felt the film was basically a rehash of the first, with the third act being nearly identical in this version, having little to no laughs, a boring story, and no standout characters. Some also have felt that their attempt to bring Egon back was done in a cheesy, predictable way, and that they relied too much on nostalgia in an attempt to cater to fanboys and girls of the franchise. Other critics were just hell-bent on proving the movie wasn't better than the 2016 version, still wanting to prop up the ladies of the reboot, although the fact that this film also featured two female Ghostbusters and was loved by a much larger portion of the fan base sort of demolished the idea that fans are just a bunch of sexist geeks and basement dwellers unwilling to accept or appreciate females in leading roles. My personal opinion is that the movie was okay, but didn't thrill or amaze me to any strong degree. I did enjoy it more than the reboot, but don't necessarily feel it matched the tone of the originals in as many ways as it could have. The score was pretty much perfect, as was the cinematography, which alone made the movie more watchable than the reboot in my opinion, as it was just visually and audibly more appealing. And I don't have a problem with Gozer returning, as some did because I thought it was a cool way to tie the films together, and the new version of the Terror Dogs and Gozer looked similar enough but better than the originals given the use of modern technology, which is what you want when you're recreating a modern version of a movie or characters fans already know and love, unlike the look of Slimer in the reboot, which didn't do the original justice. This brings me to my next point, which is that it would have been cool to see Slimer again. However, I suppose it wouldn't have made much sense for the character to have coincidentally shown up 40 years later on the other side of the country, so I understand why they left him out. But it really didn't make sense to bring back Stay Puft either, and they chose to do that. I give them credit for their attempt in this regard, but it kind of just didn't make sense to me why there would be a bunch of mini Stay Puffs when he only existed in the original because Ray thought of the mellow mascot when asked by Gozer to choose a form of their destructor. The 2016 reboot actually incorporated the character in a more logical way. I also wasn't really a fan of the Oklahoma setting. The idea that Egon went there because of the goings-on in the town was a unique idea, but for me, this should be a New York film as I said in part 1 of this video regarding Ghostbusters 2. I like that they kept that story in New York, and I sort of wish they had done the same here. Jason has said he made the change in order to have a different color palette for the film to set a different mood, with more of a warm golden vibe, which visually was beautiful, but a bit off-brand. And some things, like the exposition dump during the phone call between Ray and Phoebe, or the way the Ghostbusters just show up randomly at the end, kind of lacked a bit of sense and creativity. But I suppose I understand why they would do this to save time in the movie and keep things moving rather than burning out the audience like many new films seem to do. Although I was still kind of bored for a good portion of the movie anyway. I'm also not a huge fan of Ghostbuster kids and think they should have done something with college age kids in New York similar to the Extreme Ghostbusters series but with Ray as the leader rather than Egon. Overall it was an okay film but I don't have the love for it that many fans seem to. So in closing this summary, I'll use the same metric to judge it that I did with the 2016 reboot in Ghostbusters 2. Was the story good? Well, it wasn't great, but it was okay. Were the special effects good? The special effects were amazing. Was it well executed? In many ways it was, minus the exposition dump and a couple plot holes. And was it funny? Well, this movie wasn't really trying to be funny. So although that's sort of a disappointment, I don't think it's necessarily fair to judge it based on how funny it was. The difference between this movie and the reboot is that was supposed to be funny. It tried to be funny but wasn't. This movie just didn't try to be funny. So instead, I'll say was it entertaining? Well for many fans, maybe. But if you don't go into this with the knowledge of the first film, or already being a fan, then possibly not so much. In late 2021, not long after the premiere of Afterlife, it was announced that they would be continuing the franchise on this path 
and releasing an Afterlife sequel in the near future. Little details have been released about their plans for the new film. However, Jason Reitman has said he'd be open to incorporating Vigo the Carpathian into the story, as fans felt Ghostbusters 2 had been largely ignored in the third installment. They also released a box DVD set of the three Ghostbuster movies, minus the reboot, much to Paul Feig's chagrin. But after complaining about being snubbed by Sony, they included a digital download of his movie to appease him. Between the time of the 2016 reboot and Ghostbusters Afterlife, there was also talks about developing another animated series called Ghostbusters Ecto Force, which was said by Ivan Reitman to have plans of taking place globally 20 years into the future, making use of much of the traditional ghost lore that exists in countries like Japan or Korea. But the project was put on hold by Sony Pictures Animation until after the release of Afterlife and little has been spoken about the project outside of an announcement in June 2022 that it would be released on Netflix and is being headed by Jason Reitman and co-writer of Afterlife, Gil Kennan. There have also been talks of an animated Ghostbusters movie in recent years, putting a spin on the story by having it take place from the perspective of a ghost, similar to the way Slimer was portrayed in the real Ghostbusters animated series but it's not yet known who that ghost will be and little information has been released on the plans for the project. And in early 2022, it was also announced that another first-person multiplayer video game, Ghostbusters Spirits Unleashed, was in development for PC and console, allowing the player to bust ghosts as one of a new team being led by Ray and Winston, as well as being able to play from a ghost perspective. In February 2022, News hit the public that the legendary Ivan Reitman had passed away unexpectedly while sleeping. This was tragic news not only for his family, but for the millions of fans who grew up loving and laughing at the many movies he helped create. With his passing, it's now up to Jason Reitman to continue his legacy by heading future Ghostbuster projects, and it won't be the same without him. But fans can be grateful and optimistic that the franchise is still in the family and good hands. And at least Ivan lived to take part and witness the success of the new chapter for the epic franchise he started all those years ago. I hope you all enjoyed this two-part series. If you did, clicking like would be an appreciated payment for the many hours of hard work that went into it. Subscribe for more Culture Geist content. And for now, that's it for the history of the greatest ghost story ever told. I'll see you on the next one, and until then, live well and take it easy. Later!